Hello, my name is Terrence Barkin. I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council, and we are hosting today's webinar on graphene dispersions. Before we get started, I just want to make you aware of the antitrust statement from the Graphene Council. We do represent the entire ecosystem and supply chain for graphene that includes suppliers, producers, and end users. There are prohibited activities which are listed here in our antitrust statement, which apply to any meeting that takes place that's hosted or affiliated with the Graphene Council. So I thank you for being aware of that and respecting those regulations. The Graphene Council was founded in 2013 and today is the largest community for graphene producers, researchers, application developers, and end users. And we are pleased to host today's webinar and have you join us as part of our delivery of education. Here you have a list of a partial list of our members, which includes research institutes and universities, as I mentioned, graphene producers and end users. We are the largest group for this sector in the world. Benefits of membership include being part of this global network. We also provide our organizational members with the graphene report, which is more than 600 pages covering every aspect of graphene production and commercial forms of material, including a profile of more than 200 companies that produce graphene materials. Now, today's session is going to be talking about how to actually use and apply graphene materials, in, in particular, how to disperse them into a host material. Graphene is extremely versatile and it's, a, it's attracted a lot of interest because it has so many positive attributes. The problem that we've seen and the reason why maybe some folks who have worked with graphene in the past have struggled is that the dispersion process step of working with graphene is not extremely straightforward and is also a critical step. So for example, you could have extremely good uh, graphene material, but if it's not dispersed properly into a host material for an end application, the end application will fail. And that would not be the fault of the material, that would be a deficiency in how to do the processing. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Just to have a primer for those of you who may not be that familiar with graphene materials, technically it's a one atom thick layer of carbon that's uh, sp2 bonded in a uh, lattice formation or in a crystal formation. The reason why it's attracted so much attention is it has exceptional properties including electrical conductivity, transparency, thermal transfer, tensile strength, and flex. Um, so it really has multifunctionality and um, is quite quite. Um, interesting from that perspective. This is an extremely high aspect ratio material. So graphene is about one third of one nanometer in height at a single sheet and can be in the horizontal plane dimensions, uh, submicron to multiple micron lateral size. So it gives an extremely high aspect ratio, which in turn affects uh, dispersibility and viscosity. In terms of commercial forms of graphene, because we always hear, okay, I have this graphene material, uh, but it's not always a, a single layer material. It can be one to three layers of carbon, two to five layers of carbon, two to 10 layers of carbon. And graphene nanoplatelets might exceed 10 layers of carbon, but they still would be considered some form of commercial graphene material and certainly have commercial utility. And so each of these differences, not only in the layer size, but in the lateral size, have an impact on dispersibility. In addition to those forms that were described on this previous slide, you also have graphene oxides, which have approximately 35% by weight oxygen content, reduced graphene oxide, which is what it sounds like, a graphene oxide with the oxygen reduced or uh, removed, that brings it down to about 5% oxygen by weight, Graphene can also be delivered in the form of a powder, a dry powder. It can be in a solvent or a solution, and it can be in the form of a paste. And so we have these different types of uh, format to receive the material in um, graphene nanoplatelets. And then functionalized graphene, where we are adding or decorating uh, the graphene either on the surface or on the edges with additional elements or compounds. And so that gives you a little bit of a background. Now, when it comes to dispersion, what we'd like to suggest as a way of thinking about this and organizing our thoughts and the presentations you'll hear from our subject matter experts will follow this format is to talk about a process approach. So what's the first thing you have to do is looking at the material characterization. And we wanna be aware of the most common errors and issues in 
compounding or, or uh, dispersing graphene materials. You have a uh, range of dispersion methods that can be used. And then at the end, we have to verify, did we actually achieve a good dispersion? And so I'm not going to go into detail, but this is the framework that we will use. And on that material characterization, you have to understand what type of graphene you actually have. And of course, you need to understand the behavioral uh, performance of your, the matrix you're putting it into, whether it be a liquid or a solid. Common issues include agglomeration, deformation, incorrect loading factors, using surfactants or surfactants are left on the graphene material and other impurities, uh, viscosity and temperatures that are used, and also just nanomaterial handling because I mentioned this is, this is a material that's in the sub, uh, sub nanomaterial in, in one dimension or sub micron. Dispersion methods include things like high shear mixing, melt mixing, you have sonication, um, twin screw extrusion, planetary mixers, uh, ball milling, and other methods. And of course, these not only can be used on their own, but they can be used in combination and at different process stages. And then for dispersion verification, primarily we're looking at TEM and SEM visual uh, verification, but you can always use, um, in addition to that, other rheological uh, behavioral uh, testing for the material to see if you've actually achieved a good dispersion before you go on to make your end product, which is actually the objective of doing all this is to is to incorporate graphene into an application. So that gives you kind of the, uh, the high level overview of how we're going to approach today's subject. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce our first uh, panel or, or a pair of uh, subject matter experts, Dr. Adrian Potts, who's the CEO of Applied Graphene Materials, uh, one of the leading companies in this area and who have a, a great deal of knowledge and expertise in how to handle graphene material, including this dispersion method. And he's joined by Andy Gent from the UK. Um, Adrian's in the United States, Andy's in the UK. And uh, with that, I'm gonna hand over Adrian. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and share your screen, it's gonna be all yours. Welcome everyone and thanks for the opportunity to uh, share with you a little bit about what we do um, at Applied Graphene Materials. So we're, as Terence mentioned, we're a UK based company um, I'm the CEO um, with that company. I spend part of my time in the US and part in the UK. And then Andy, my co-presenter, is uh, is based in the UK. So we're a 10-year startup. It's our 10-year anniversary actually today. So sorry, some great achievements been made over the past years. Um, we have offices in the USA, as as I mentioned, and then um, distributors globally. And we're seeking to, to add to our distribution network in terms of creating the opportunity to uh, make this make this materials technology more available. So Terence covered the background um, to, to a degree on this remarkable material called graphene. When you look at the single layer performance of that material, remarkable properties. The key thing in terms of practical application of this material is how you translate those properties into real applications and one of the one of the quotes from the graphene council in their commercialization report uh, from this year is all of the tension that you have with this novel remarkable technology the right material so picking the right type of graphene at the right price point of course and matching that with the specific application and the aspiration of performance that uh, that you're looking for so in terms of range of materials there's a whole raft of different materials in this space as uh, as terence was talking to earlier just in terms of materials uh, materials availability um, from different degrees of functionalization right the way through to different formats different morphologies one of the key things though in our business model and the way that we've approached graphene manufacturing and then application of this technology is the dispersion technology is really the key means, the key method for realizing the remarkable performance that graphene has to offer. So we've seen this slide before, I won't uh, dwell on this, but it uh, just covers some of the materials that we'll be talking to as I said before, there are many different types of, of graphene in terms of your uh, nano material additive that you're that you're looking to add to 
your end use material. We would say that equally important to that is understanding what you are trying to put the graphene into and what you're trying to achieve with that. So in other words, to make graphene work, if you can, if you can add graphene to the end use application correctly, then you can make remarkable use of that material to great advantage in the end use application. So the keys uh, for us and where we've done a huge amount of development work over the over the years is about application technology and a clear understanding not just of the of the graphing material that you're trying to incorporate but also the end use um, that the material is going into what does that involve it's not rocket science really but a deep engagement with the end customer the more information that we that we receive from our customers in terms of unpacking what they're trying to achieve the better and the, the greater likelihood of success in terms of understanding objectives and, and needs. And whether that's the application of a standard dispersion that we have on offer off the shelf, or whether it's a customized solution that is end use specific, that is typical of, of what we do and how we do it. Clearly, we, we need to back that, um, that engagement up with what we call how-to data. So how-to it enables the easy use of this uh, amazing material in the end user's application. So we have um, available on our website a whole load of um, technical application notes and data in terms of supporting what we're, what we're doing in our chosen field, supporting that how-to knowledge in terms of practical applications on how to assist you, the customer, in terms of... Uh, incorporating this material in a meaningful and constructive way to achieve the great end result that you're looking for. We see ourselves also as um, part of the group that are very much involved in regulatory leadership on the use of nanomaterials and particularly graphene, um, particularly with regard to REACH regulations in Europe. Our particular chosen fields for us as a company um, are are really looking at un unlocking the use of graphene in four key areas, really. So coatings, technology, so uh, paints and coatings, and utilizing the remarkable impermeability of graphene to, to work as a barrier material. A lot of composites, um, looking at the addition of graphene to things like carbon fiber composites to further enhance uh, mechanical performance and, and other attributes. Uh, printable materials, and then thermal adhesive so utilizing the thermal conductivity of this material in dispersed format to enhance end use performance and that's just a few out of the, the vast array of opportunities that that, uh, that graphene presents so in terms of the, the particulars of what we manufacture we're a manufacturer of graphene materials two core types and then we have a number of other products in the range as well but um, just to touch on in terms of the difference between just two different types of graphene. So on the left hand side here you see very platey material. Uh, um, we actually classify this as a reduced graphene oxide composed of nanoplatelet plates, um, relatively thick around 15 to 20 atomic layers. And uh, um, you know it's, it's, a, it's a kind of good general purpose material for use in a range of applications, whether that's composite materials or, or coatings technology, and typical loading levels that we would dis deploy this material in the end use application would be at around a quarter to around 1%. So we have to think through how we will deliver that, that type of doping into the end use application. And that's what this presentation is all about. And on the right hand side of this, a, a, a very different type of material um, named AGMP35, a low oxygen content, high carbon content, morphology wise, very, very different. So a, a, a thin crumpled sheets, um, around five atomic layers thick, very, very low density, very high surface area. And in particular, we have used this material to great effect through our dispersion technology into the world of anti-corrosion coatings, very low loadings um, that we use in those applications. So typically 0.025% up to about 0.1% in a 
paint uh, formulation. Key attribute with, uh, with this material is its impermeability and adding to the tortuosity through a coating compared to other materials that are typically used in a coating application. So um, it's a super efficient material and at very low loading level we see a huge increase in the surface area compared to materials that are conventionally used. So just some of the flow really through this thought process for decision making on, on graphene. So first of all, why graphene? What could graphene do for me in terms of utilizing those uh, performance attributes? Um, even in the graphene nanoplate form, the material still has remarkable performance. Huge surface area advantage, as we mentioned in the last slide, for example, um, over other fillers. The aspect ratio advantage, the conductivity, the mechanical performance, thermal conductivity, and so on. Um, the right form of graphene. What am I hoping to achieve in the end application that I'm looking to add graphene to? Um, the key characteristics that I'm looking to, to uh, improve the performance with. So what are my target properties through the integration of, of graphene? And then we get onto the key question of how, how am I going to integrate this material into my end manufactured product? Uh, what's the format of what I'm trying to achieve and how do I add performance to that? So what's the, what's the material that I'm looking to add to? Is it a thermoplastic or liquid resin system and thermoset, elastomers, oils, uh, a foam structure or composite material? And really the key question is how could I best introduce graphene into this format and conversely how what are the best things that i can do to avoid failure further things to do with graphene am i okay using a nano powder at all there are a number of um, production environments where um, nano materials are frowned on and uh, we'll talk to a little more about that in one of the later slides if if we're using a dispersion what would be the best option to deliver the graphene into the target material and is that media compatible with um, with the host material that we are putting it into so we go to great pains in um, in what we do at AGM to join all these dots together and answer all of these questions to enhance the opportunity for success so understanding where the material will be used and when it will be added so compatibility not just with materials from a chemistry process but um, how the material will be added and whether that will upset the balance of the rest of the formulation is it's absolutely critical that the material is added both in the right way and at the right stage so for example in the world of coatings we have um, some great recommendations about not just offering this as a dispersion but when to add it to the coating and just about balance in terms of adding these very high aspect ratio high surface area materials it's very easy to for example to upset the balance of the end use uh, product that you're looking to uh, add this material to so coming back to our experience in coatings for example we look at things like pigment volume concentration and the balance between solids and liquid resin and the ability of that resin to wet out all of the material that is in there you start introducing high surface area materials into that equation and it's easy to push that uh, that coating formulation over the edge and actually introduce porosity into the system so we have to be very careful about how we balance uh, what we offer with the end use application so thinking through objectives in terms of our dispersion loading level um, some of the variables that we have in place. So loading level is a key area to control. And when you think about some of the very low loadings that I talked about earlier in the end use application, we want to, we want to match that with the ability of the formulator to have maximum flexibility in what they're doing. So what we aspire to is balancing that between what we put into the dispersion versus what is going to end up in the end use application. We also have to think carefully uh, in collaboration with the customer about what happens to the rest of the dispersion. So if we're supplying something with say 
10% graphene and it's 90% uh, solvent or um, a high percentage of solvent or water. We have to think about what happens to the rest of that material, um, the, the water or the solvent in this case, in that formulation and how um, in some cases that has to be evaporated off and how that will, um, how that will work in the end use application. Things like reactives, um, can we actually use um, reactive components of the end use formulation to use as the dispersion media to enhance the performance of the, uh, of the end use product? And then is graphene actually replacing something? So are we using the dispersion to create the opportunity to replace other things in the end customer's application? Typical things that we uh, look at in, in our world will be um, things like iron oxides and uh, pigments generally, micas, and then um, functional materials in coatings such as uh, zinc phosphates and chromates and so on. So a little more about dispersions and uh, what do we actually want out of that? Clearly we need stability. We want the dispersion to be the same as received by the end customer as it is three, six, maybe 12 months down the line. Scalability of dispersion. It's easy to achieve great results of, of, uh, with materials technology in the lab. Uh, we want to now be confident that we can actually scale that process into larger volume. Other variables uh, clearly have a huge influence on the end use application. Viscosity of that dispersion, particle size, um, settling and agglomeration, and can I actually uh, recover that and the whole question of how will the material be used. So what do we want in the end customer's formulation? What are we aiming for? Clearly the, the utilization of graphene in terms of uh, great utility, great functionality is to achieve a separated array of graphene nanoplatelets as individual platelets in the end use formulation. And those graphene platelets can then do the job intended, whether that's mechanical performance, thermal, electrical, and so on. Um, we want a great separation of those graphene platelets in the, in the end formulation. And that is what we're all about in the dispersion technology that we offer. Conversely, what are the things that we're trying to avoid? Um, clearly agglomeration where the platelets actually uh, end up sticking together. We end up with just in simple terms a, uh, a, a filler rather than a high utility product in the in the end formulation. Uh, sedimentation and whether that's recoverable or even crash out due to incompatibility of the dispersion in the end application. Just to touch on a few of those points, so dispersion stability. Key questions, is the dispersion stable? And um, you know, does it sediment out? And what's the quality of that sedimentation? Um, can dispersion be recovered and how? And we have some um, excellent guidance um, in our application notes on, on how to do that. And what are the implications for the end customer in terms of um, how to practically use this material? So typical uh, at the bottom of this slide is what we see um, for just grabbing some data for some of our products. In this case, a dispersion of uh, AGMP10, this very platy material in a liquid epoxy, 12 month shelf life. And you can see at the bottom right in this slide, uh, very good stability from a particle size um, standpoint in terms of, uh, in terms of stability of the dispersion. And the left-hand side, the uh, upper, um, the upper, upper graphic just describes what we aspire to in terms of stability of products. So a uniform dispersion with life, um, whether this is tested at three months, six months or 12 months, we want to see uniformity of, uh, of that, uh, that dispersion with life. And we do a huge amount of testing in this regard. A bad result would be at the bottom left of this slide where we see um, clear Initially, pooling of, uh, in this case, a solvent, um, a solvent dispersion, and the graphene ending up at the bottom of the bottle. Clearly, we don't want that, and we we do a lot of work in terms of achieving stable and uniform dispersions. 
uh, viscosity. So viscosity of the dispersion, it, clearly the, one of the key questions is whether that's fit for end use purpose. So considerations that come into play here, particle size of platelets, surface area of platelets, and if you recall back to the earlier slide, huge differences in terms of morphology of material, the way that wets out and the way that the surface area interacts um, in the dispersion. The chemistry on the platelets, uh, Terence talked to that in terms of oxygen content, for example, and that has a unique effect on dispersibility and that in, it, in, in turn an effect on viscosity as well. Um, loading levels clearly again have a uh, critical effect on viscosity and you know a, a knock-on effect on form formulating flexibility. So again just joining all those together what's the end users process? How do we engage with the end users process to understand um, what are the constraints and what are the limitations on, um, on how to use this material effectively. Um, we have guidelines, typically in coatings we recommend adding uh, graphene dispersions at the letdown stage of the manufacture process after all of the grinding of the fillers, just as a practical example of how to use this material effectively. So how does particle size distribution, um, looking at particle size for a moment, impact the end use applications? Well, there are clearly considerations in terms of aspect ratio and actual physical particle size and how this fits with the end use ap application. So to pick the example of composite materials, um, when we look at things like fiber diameter, for example, versus the size of graphene particles, versus the volume fraction that we are going to be applying both of the carbon fiber in, in the case of a carbon fiber composite and the volume fraction of graphene that we're going to be adding and how all that interacts together in terms of what we are looking to achieve. The example in coatings, um, aspect ratio is a, is a huge issue for barrier performance, but other aspects as well, such as conductivity and mechanical performance and the flexibility of paints. Um, we can see a nice example in the middle left of, uh, of this chart, just in terms of the ability to dial in uh, particle size. Um, and we can do that through the range of processing methods that we employ in manufacture of dispersions. So starting with the, the base material, um, which has a fairly broad, the blue line, a fairly broad um, spectrum in terms of particle size from a uh, little over a micron up to 100 microns, and then able to dial that in very effectively through process technology using a range of process methods. Where does this all end up? Clearly we have uh, dispersion products that we, that we offer to the market and our principal product offering is in two forms really. Standard dispersion, so balancing the graphene type, the loading level, the particle size, the viscosity, the stability. Uh, we have a range of standard dispersions in a range of different epoxies, solvents, water, and so on. And then um, custom dispersions as well, and master batches to suit the end use application. Uh, Terence talked about some of the common issues related to dispersion technology, and there are clear things to be at least cognizant of in terms of understanding how you're going to deploy these materials in practical applications. Agglomeration is a key one to be avoided. And you know that in and of itself is challenging to undo in the dispersion, let alone in the finished formulation. And we would have to do a lot of work with that dispersion to undo agglomeration. Um, deformation, so being aware of the grind of the material and particularly avoiding grinding the material too far. Uh, particle size and aspect ratio are important features in the utilization of these uh, nanoplatelets in the end use application. A loading level clearly has a huge influence on um, cause and effect in the end application. Use of other materials, so surfactants and so on, here there's a great opportunity to do that to produce a custom dispersion to suit but we want to carefully select those and ensure compatibility with the end application. Uh, color, um, 
graphene is a remarkable UV, a UV blocker. And, um, you know, we, a small addition of graphene can add to a strong, um, a strong color shift, both in the, in the dispersion that we have to offer, but also in the end use application. Maybe not so important in some applications, but certainly in the world of coatings, where you're looking to manage color uh, in a top coat application, for example, or in a direct to metal uh, coating, coloration can be an important consideration. And, you know, we have to admit that graphene isn't suitable for use in every application. Um, impurities from process clearly need to be avoided, viscosity issues, and then nanomaterial handling. We touched on this earlier. Safe use of nanomaterials is, is crucial. Um, that's why we've approached the business the way that we have in terms of putting graphene into dispersion to enhance its safe use and give confidence to the end user uh, about use of this material. A lot has been done, particularly in our work in coatings technology, not just in safe use of dispersions, but also in um, practical applications for um, sprayable, sprayable coatings, whether that's aerosol or whether it's um, larger volume spraying. And just to touch on um, nanomaterial handling, whether it's REACH or Tosca accreditation or the whole deal related to high aspect ratio nanomaterials, there are clear questions to ask. So what's the nano form of graphene in question? So coming back to the particular material, is it actually graphene at all? Or is it a nanographite for an exfoliated product? You know, what exactly are we dealing with? And what is the particular nano form of graphene that we are looking at? Related to that is, is whether there's read across from the toxicology uh, data that we have in, in available to us. Um, what are the volume effects and, and the supporting data that are required with that? Because there are clear thresholds um, in regulatory approval whereby uh, larger volumes require more and more data to support um, the, the safe use of these materials. And then, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, to satisfy the end user's uh, concerns, we want to understand what happens to the graphene in the end product. Um, and clearly, our focus with that is on safe use of graphene in the workplace. And we see that as a major milestone to and being crucial to adoption of this technology. We've done a huge amount of work in this area, looking, as I mentioned before, sprayable coatings and proving to ourselves and proving to the community that uh, graphene stays put in sprayable coatings and, and doesn't become uh, a free material in those types of applications. So just looking at methodology briefly, um, we can do, as Terence mentioned earlier, all manner of different methods and use of those in, in combination um, to manage the things that we've talked about, viscosity, particle size. Just as a brief example on linked effects from processing, um, just very briefly, just looking at uh, viscosity effects. So this is with very high surface area material on the left hand side. Viscosity needs to be managed as we talked to before in terms of loading level. And um, the bars on this chart are around um, sheet resistivity, surface resistivity or conductivity. And with loading level, um, we can see a nice reduction in uh, in resistivity with loading level. Managing particle size in the middle of this chart, so for a given particle size, um, we can see the effect of loading level, in this case on conductivity or resistivity. And then for particle size impact, um, in terms of multiple milling, um, where we're looking at process technology and looking at the number of milling cycles that we would, um, that we would run with this material. Clearly larger platelets, have a good effect for conductivity and, um, and managing resistivity. Lastly, and just my bit before I hand over to Andy, just for a brief um, wrap up of our section. Um, so dispersion verification, and this is so important, not just looking at um, what we have in the dispersion, but for quality control, for volume manufacturing. Uh, clearly, suffice it to say, we can um, manage this process well, 
with a whole raft of different methodologies to um, to understand the quality aspects of dispersion. We utilize uh, TEM and SEM. Um, clearly, those are great tools to look at powders, um, viscometry, UV analysis, mechanicals, electrical testing, thermal analysis are key things that we do routinely on dispersions and end use applications to prove out the quality and the consistency of these dispersed materials. With that, I'm briefly going to hand over to Andy, um, who can spend hopefully a couple of minutes just talking to the uh, the outcomes of all of this. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. I hope uh, hope everybody can hear me. As Adrian talked to, really, it's it's there's a lot of work that's gone into getting us to this point, to getting uh, an understanding of the stabilization of graphene dispersions, um, and our approach, the the end to end approach, talking from right from the development of those dispersions right through to the application of those in, uh, in existing industrial systems has really given us a, a, a practical know-how of how to use these, these products to give real benefits in, in real existing industrial paints or, or composite systems. Um, the, the examples here shown on the screen, this is, this is a, a, a library which is growing um, of our te technical application notes. and uh, They're all available. Uh, on our website, as Adrian mentioned, it gives a real in-depth look at starting point formulations, uh, test methods, and how to disperse, how to use the products, and and really also gives a, a good understanding of, of the benefits and the the uh, results that can be generated through the addition of our graphene dispersions in a number of applications. Um, it really is the the kind of how-to guides of how to use the products. And then with that in mind, just to give you some understanding of, of, of some of the success stories that we've had. Um, as Adrian touched on, uh, the, the graphene dispersions offer some very, very good, strong outstanding performance in, in barrier systems, anti-corrosion systems. Um, this example here is a, is a company that we've been working with in the UK to solvent-based aerosol respray system for the automotive industry. Um, a very basic primer in itself only withstood around about 300, 400 hours prohesion salt spray. And the graphene panel that you can see there is a 0.1% addition of graphene after 3,000 hours of salt, prohesion salt spray. So around about a four, five, six fold increase in, in corrosion resistance. And, and as you can see from the photos, these are commercially available products that can be, that can be bought here in the UK. Another example on the next slide is, um, is a system that we're again working with a UK company. These are a, a corrugated steel roofing company. Um, again, a simple addition of our graphene paints at, at low loading levels, 0 0.05, 0 0.025% addition rates. Um, again, into existing systems, minimal reformulation work, just close cooperation with ourselves, with our technical team to really understand how and when to add the graphene to maximize um, the performance benefits and, and as you can see from, from the photo they offer a 30-year guarantee on this product and um, that's an uplift from a 20-year guarantee on the on the graphene free system so it's a significant uplift in performance the, the salt spray resistance is truly outstanding for this product it's it's, it's quite a, an exceptional product right at the high end performance levels of, uh, of corrosion coatings and then moving away from coatings, as, as Adrian touched on, into carbon fiber composite systems. We've got a couple of examples. This one is a, a, a simple carbon fiber prepreg where we are looking at uh, increasing some of the mechanical properties, also offering light weighting. Still in uh, moving into a commercial product at the moment and, and offering some really interesting increases in, in fracture toughness and, and also um, from a surface finish point of view, really giving a, a a nice added bonus. And the final example I'll quickly touch on is a, is a system that we're working with a, a company in the US. This is a cryogenic pressure vessel using the graphene dispersions in a, in a couple of ways for a carbon fiber filament wound system. Again, showing some outstanding performance at some really quite extreme environmental temperatures and pressures. And, and it just demonstrates that if you, if you work with the right dispersions, adding it at the right, times and, and and really working closely with us to 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 generate that um, know-how you can get some quite outstanding uplifts in performance um, in an in a 
cross-section of applications. Well, thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. You obviously have a wealth of knowledge and experience that you've accumulated. And so we, we definitely appreciate that. We do have a presentation now from Chromaflow Technologies, which have many, many years um, experience in working with uh, nanomaterials and nano additives, um, and in particular have their expertise in, in dispersion technologies as well. So Paul, if you guys are ready to go ahead and share your screen. So Chromaflow is a global manufacturer of colorant and uh, specialty chemical uh, additive packages and dispersions for the, uh, for the architectural industrial coatings markets as well as for uh, the composites industry. Um, we've been in particular, we've been in, in business of making dispersions of carbonaceous materials on nanoscale for about 25 years. Some of our largest commercially sold products in the world are, are based on that type of technology. Give you an idea of our overview, our, uh, we have multiple um, technical and, uh, and manufacturing facilities spread throughout North America, our headquarters and in principle, um, R&D Center is in Asheville, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. We also have facilities in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, and, uh, and, and also in Uruguay. We, are, we have multiple um, technical and, and man manufacturing facilities in Europe. Also, we are in South Africa. We have a significant facility in, in India, uh, a brand new facility that we just built in, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. We are also have a facility in Shanghai, China, and also Danamong, Australia. So we're literally prepared to cover and support um, our customers in pretty much all every continent of the world. Um, some of the cases where we are, we are involved with, we do work with architectural point of sales, architectural implant, um, coloring. We work with our industrial maintenance, concrete, um, automotive interiors, and refinish. We are both in the composites and the coating sides of the transportations and the constructions industry. You'll see here some pictures of some, um, some automobiles. You'll see some pictures of marine applications. We will be involved in marine coatings, and we are also involved in, uh, in composite materials and construction industry, such as the, the composite ladders that you see in the upper right-hand corner. So in getting to graphene, there are two major approaches in, in industry to make you manufacturing graphene and and each of them has significant implications in terms of what you get when you get there so to speak uh, the top to bottom approach involves starting with graphite and peeling down a number of layers until you get eventually to a graphene sheet and on the other hand the other side of it there are people that are taking uh, basically starting with carbon atoms uh, most typically and most commonly by not, but not necessarily by carbon vapor deposition and then depositing uh, the carbon into layers of, onto a substrate such as copper sheeting, and then removing the layers. And, and the latter, and which particular approach you get, each of them is developed, is, is divided into a significant number of sub-steps and sub-processes and, and, and variants and processes that are made. And a number of different types of materials that you can get from it can, it can affect not only their cost, but also your purity and the properties of the graphene that you're going to get. So when we talk about graphene, it's not a homologous material. There's a lot of different materials that fall under the general category of graphene. And so we need to be aware of that when we begin to set up, talk about how we make dispersions for it and talk about how we achieve the properties that we're trying to get. Um, several different types of categories of materials that can come out of graphene would include the graphene sheet itself shown in this middle blue layer coming up and down. But another thing that can happen is you can also have the sheets roll into tubes that we would then call carbon nanotubes. And then also, finally, there's also the possibility for the carbon to come up into the balls and, and form, uh, form a carbon, uh, what we call fullerene structures. Um, this is all from the graphene hexagonal close pack structure that originally is a, coming from a planar two-dimensional object. Uh, Santosh, would you like to, to comment further? Yeah, so I'm I'm going to talk about uh, like uh, how we're going to characterize this material, uh, like uh, uh, for the characterization, uh, uh, like the techniques, what kind of techniques we use to characterize this material. The first one I'm going to mention about the TEM, uh, which is uh, uh, like uh, the high, high resolution TEM, which is uh, 
a very good technique to uh, get an idea about the morphology of uh, the any nanoparticle. So if you look at this slide here, uh, at the, uh, the left side image shows the graphitic structure where you can see that uh, we have like, a, uh, like more than thousands layered just like a stack uh, on, uh, on top of each other. However, when we look at the right side structure, uh, right, right side image, you can see here we have just like a, a few layer graphene. So, uh, so the TEM provide you uh, information regarding uh, uh, like uh, uh, their morphology and the particle size and particle size distribution. But uh, that information is not enough to get uh, idea about uh, what kind of material you are dealing with. So you require some uh, further uh, for the characterization of the material so the so uh, the another uh, techniques uh, we use uh, is called like a uh, uh, xps uh, and which is like a, uh, also a good technique to characterize the surface chemistry like if you wanted to see that how uh, uh, what what making change in that hexagonal uh, uh, the benzene ring like if we are converting uh, during the, our process, or like doing any chemical treatment, if we are uh, uh, we are introducing any functionality, or like anyhow we are changing that uh, sp2 hybridization to sp3 hybridization. If you look at uh, uh, in this slide here, uh, uh, like the left to bottom, we have it uh, the the table where we uh, characterized uh, two different material. One uh, is a GNP, graphene nanoparticle, another one functionalized graphene nanoparticle. So we just put some functional group on that. You can see here how like uh, uh, the hybridization like uh, uh, changing from SP2 to SP3 and their ratio is changing and then concentration of oxygen uh, containing white is also changing. Uh, so, so these techniques provide you information of the surface chemistry. And the next technique uh, we talk about the uh, uh, the Raman spectroscopy, which is a very uh, useful uh, in the, the tool to uh, tool to uh, evaluate the uh, the nanomaterial. So the Raman spectroscopy is kind of a, a vibrational technique uh, that is very extremely sensitive uh, to geometry structure uh, and then bonding within the molecule. So if you are making any change in the geometry or in molecule we can uh, get uh, we can see that changes in uh, in, in spectra so here we are showing uh, in this slide uh, we have the three different spectra from uh, uh, from uh, uh, the same uh, graphene uh, graphene uh, uh, product but they are the uh, different batch uh, different uh, the lot so you can see here uh, like very uh, very, uh, uh, we have the three different peaks there. First one uh, uh, around uh, uh, 1350, which is called uh, the D, uh, the D peaks, uh, and we call it disorder band, and that's the defect band. We also refer as a defect bands, and uh, actually it represents the ring. Uh, breathing mode from sp2 hybridization carbon uh, ring so uh, uh, what is happening here if we are creating uh, some uh, defects on the graphene uh, we can observe clearly here we can see uh, uh, in the sample uh, uh, the uh, the green line we can see the uh, the defects like uh, getting higher and also the same technique we can also uh, use to characterize the graphene dispersion and then the, uh, like the functionalization uh, in order to see like uh, if we, uh, we are making any change on the surface chemistry or like uh, their structure uh, or like we are further exfoliating graphene if like uh, uh, we started our starting material like a few layer graphene if we do our process and we uh, uh, we exfoliate somehow so this is a really good uh, tool uh, to uh, to get an idea and uh, other other peak is here like the 2d peak we call the 2d peak which is like of uh, 1700 uh, 1700 uh, uh, the peak here uh, which provides like this peak have like a different kind of shape. By that shape, you can uh, actually uh, get uh, uh, like a, uh, we can evaluate like if we have a single layer graphene or we are dealing like a multi layer or like uh, the double layer. So that 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 information provide and that information is really uh, helpful uh, to determine either your uh, uh, like you know the graphene quality as well as your graphene dispersion. So now I'm going to talk about uh, 
uh, the challenges, what kind of challenges do you have to obtaining a stable, uh, uh, like a stable uh, graphene dispersion? The first of all, I'm going to start with the quality of graphene. Uh, you wanted to make sure you have a, a very uh, consistent uh, the supply source for graphene where you uh, you uh, you have like a no uh, you without lot to lot uh, variation like because we have seen uh, experience like uh, uh, we have seen like a lot to lot variation in the graphene quality and also like uh, you wanted to make sure a particle size distribution and then control over possible particle size aspect ratio and the second uh, second challenge like of uh, uh, we wanted to, uh, if you wanted to use uh, uh, the graphene for a particular application uh, or particular resin system, so you have you wanted to compatibilize that resin, uh, that graphene with the resin system. Uh, in order to do so, you might read, you might require uh, some kind of uh, functionalization or some kind of additives or any different, uh, any kinds of uh, uh, surface modification or some special uh, uh, like the process process are like some some chemistry there so uh, the next one is uh, 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 the second one is the appropriate loading uh, uh, we are talking about the uh, appropriate loading I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in in the next slide uh, in 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 a later slide where uh, appropriate loading is very important for uh, uh, for, for the proper for the properties so and, and then viscosity and the rheology also is important uh, uh, important in, in that matter and then process control process control is really important how, how uh, uh, like uh, it's very important how you are incorporating this graphene to your system like uh, are you I mean, it's like it's going to mix with the using any kind of techniques like either using sonication that if you use very harsh uh, technique or very rigorous uh, uh, the milling or any uh, any process method that that might create some defects and create some damage on the uh, on the on the particle which is uh, further the line uh, and and the uh, uh, further like uh, an an end application that that might translate uh, in like you know uh, uh, not a bitter property so uh, so that's very important there also and the last one is proper characterization how we're going to characterize if you have a a really uh, good quality, uh, you know, the, your dispersion is stable and uh, uh, and like uh, uh, you have, uh, 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 you, you exfoliated your material or you stabilize your material or functionalize your material. So we already talked about uh, the TEM and then STM uh, and then Raman spectral analysis. This is going to help, uh, help uh, to evaluate that one. And then next one, like a stability test, I'm going to discuss about that one. Like you can do some stability tests uh, in your laboratory or like uh, to make sure you have a stable dispersion uh, uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for a longer period uh, of time. So, uh, and then final one, property application, uh, like the property evaluation. So we can, we can uh, use a, uh, like electrical conductivity or like other property uh, evaluation to, uh, to also verify like if we have, uh, uh, if, if you have a better dispersion, a good dispersion, if you're targeting for mechanical property, you will definitely see your, in, in your, your end application. So, so for, uh, Paul, do you want to add some, uh, some comments yeah, here? Yeah, I just want to emphasize that, you know, having a, a consistent supply and, and, and being able to verify the consistency of your supply of graphene is really kind of important. But when we talk about obtaining optimal properties in final application, a lot of that really depends upon process, and that means process from start to finish, right? I think, I think one of the things Santos will be me talk, mention, maybe mentioning later on is that's very possible to damage your graphene in your process, such as especially if you're doing bisonication or, or some type of technique that produces a, a whole lot of energy on individual particles. So um, viscosity control, impact on polymer chemistry, cure kinetics will all affect the processing of your material because graphene itself is a chemical and it will inter interact with uh, certain chemistries that are taking place in your system. Um, mechanical properties can come from, from better dispersion and high interfacial interaction. Um, it's important to understand that what type of graphene dispersion you want to use and what type of graphene and what type of um, loading you're going to use is going to vary according to the types of properties you're after. If you are looking for conductivity, um, electrical conductivity, 
what's very important is you have to have a very low percolation, right? But you have to have a good dispersion with a lots of point-to-point -point contact because the electrons have to have a pathway in order to travel from one place to another. And if you disrupt that pathway, then you, your conductivity goes away. On the opposite hand, hand you know, with mechanical properties, you don't necessarily, or thermal conductivity, you don't necessarily have to have point-to-point -point contact, but you do have to have a certain, what we might call, height interfacial interaction. You need to have load transfer capability in between particles so that your the 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 force and in, in, in the and in, in the in, is that the distribution of energy is maintained between the polymer matrix and also and, and, and the graphene particles that disperse within it. And I'm not going to have to take time right now to get into right, photon scattering, but the basic principle remains that you have to have an effective dispersion uh, that's uniform and 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 complete throughout your matrix if you want to achieve a property such as thermal conductivity. So back in 2013, uh, Professor Yadav and others at the uh, University of, of Konkuk in Seoul, South Korea, did a study on uh, comparing um, graphene that had been chemically uh, functionalized to be compatible with a urethane matrix and compared it to what happens when you add pristine graphene in its place and you put that into a, the same urethane uh, composite matrix. Uh, they discovered that if you have a good uh, interface between a polymer, then you can see it under SEM, and you can see that the sheets of individual graphene remain, have, have a high level of bonding with a strong interface between the urethane with, uh, polymer and the graphene itself. If you have a weak interface, then it's very possible, as we see in the right-hand image, for the different particles to get broken apart and, and, and be separated, and, and then you don't have you don't have basically you're losing your what we would call load transfer. Um, a more graphic demonstration of this is the following image here on the left hand side. Um, the functionalized optimized graphing dispersion in the matrix remains embedded upon breakage into the polymer matrix, whereas in the um, in a material that has not been optimized and that where the graphene is not properly incorporated or functionalized for the matrix. The, uh, the, pol the polymer simply breaks away from the, uh, from the graphene platelets, and you don't necessarily get the benefit of the, the, of the platelets in terms of, contrib you know, of making a meaningful contribution to your strength. So on that note, one of the ways we can determine uh, or, or, or verify the properties of our dispersion is, is, is through simple application testing, right? And one of the things we would do is electrical, for, uh, for, especially for electrical applications, we have three major methods of measuring electrical resistivity methods. One is a one-dimensional point-to-point -point and linear ohms per uh, centimeter. Then we have a two-dimensional, which is ohms per square. And then we have a three-dimensional method that's in ohms per cubic centimeter. And it's important to understand that as we increase the surface area of contact and number of dimensions in our measurements, we increase the sensitivity and re reproducibility of our tests, as well as the number of pathways available for free electrons. So when we do this type of analysis, uh, one of the issues you're going to run into with a, a non-stabilized graphene dispersion, you can load it up and load it up and increase the loading, and you're not going to get to a point where you have a, not enough, high enough loadings of percolations of point-to-point -point contacts between graphene to achieve a, a static dissipative conductivity. And we see this in the left-hand chart where we're increasing the graphene loading to almost 3%, and it's not making a significant change to the, uh, to the resistivity in, in three-dimensional or one-dimensional uh, re re resistivity. By contrast, if we have a stabilized graphene dispersion that's compatibilized with a polyester graphene matrix here, then what will happen is you point somewhere between one and one and a half percent where the uh, graphene will begin to percolate and you'll have begin to achieve point-to-point -point contact and thereby you will begin to achieve the electrical conductivity that you're trying to achieve. You know, especially in this particular case, you're going to get to a, a static dissipative level of conductivity very quickly in the, in the one and a half to two percent reloading range. Um, Santos, do you want to comment on the stability so, testing? So yeah, this is the simple stability test. Like when you can see the difference between uh, we have the two while here at the at the right side, 
uh, you can see that if you restabilize the uh, your graphene or like uh, uh, you dispose them well, uh, they're going to stay for a longer time in any uh, like a solvent or like any monomer or polymer. Uh, they're going to stay for a longer time. So they allow you to have like you can process like if you're uh, your process involved for longer time or you can store uh, this uh, uh, these sample for a longer time also and and use them for uh, uh, for for your application so next i'm going to talk about uh, uh, the uh, the mechanical property like uh, uh, the paul already mentioned about that how uh, how like uh, the interfacial interaction between graphene and uh, polymer matrix play a role uh, uh, to to translate uh, to load transfer the the a mecha mechanical property to uh, in the polymer system. So here you can see we have example. We have example like where we take a, a functionalized graphene and just like the, uh, just uh, just uh, just uh, 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 the raw graphene and just add it in the uh, uh, like a polyurethane elastomer and uh, we observe like a very high uh, modulus enhancement of, uh, uh, that was several fold enhancement in modulus and other property uh, other property also so so that's uh, uh, like a loading was like up, up to three percent we, uh, we we could achieve like uh, uh, the modulus to 113 uh, uh, megapascal uh, megapascal so it was kind of a uh, uh, when you have like a better uh, dispersion uh, as well as a, a good interfacial interaction between gra uh, graphene and and your host matrix uh, then uh, it, it, it will have like a better uh, load transfer and next slide I'm talking about uh, 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 like uh, here giving an example uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the this uh, like a stabilized dispersion in uh, in, in, in a pultrusion system where a polyester we took a polyester and then added uh, the, the the graphene like uh, uh, at the different loading earlier i was talking about like how important it is to determine like optimize your loading so you can see this uh, uh, the the left size image uh, that is the storage modulus uh, root temperature storage modulus val uh, value of uh, a polymer composite uh, and what we observe here when we incorporated the graphene like you know starting from uh, uh, 0.01 percent to all the way three percent and we observe that uh, we we could achieve like a 30 percent enhancement in storage modulus value by adding 0.5 percent graphene dispersion however uh, beyond that uh, like when we add one percent or three percent graphene we saw like detrimental impact on the uh, on the uh, on the storage modulus value so we know uh, we need to find this uh, and that's kind of sweet spot where you can get the maximum uh, uh, you know the load transfer and and kind of you have uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the balance between uh, filler and uh, and polymer uh, polymer polymer uh, matrix uh, and here like uh, the right side of image here we are showing very interestingly when we added even to uh, one percent is not not impacting the crosslink density of uh, uh, of the polymer composite so uh, for uh, we we, uh, we don't see any uh, uh, any a, 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 any change in in uh, in tg there was like few degree up and down but here we see when we add like one percent graphene we even see further boost in the tg however uh, in uh, in in epoxy system when we uh, when we added uh, uh, the graphene dispersion uh, in uh, in, uh, in in epoxy system, we see here uh, we could achieve like 28 percent enhancement in storage modulus uh, storage modulus value just by adding uh, 0.1 percent graphene. And however, beyond that one, we see like again decrease in the storage modulus value. So it's all depend on like you know. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, stabilization you are using and how you are processing uh, the graphene and what kind of uh, a, one ca what kind of polymer matrix you are using and here also we observe there was few degree uh, like a change in uh, in, in viscosity we saying that uh, we suggesting that there was some change in cross linking density in uh, in composite after adding uh, like a few percent of graphene so so here uh, uh, this is just uh, just uh, like we are giving quick uh, 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 the view here we have uh, uh, we have uh, 
several uh, graphene uh, dispersion where uh, like we have developed several graphene dispersion like they are very high highly loaded like uh, we have like 28 percent to 36 percent uh, graphene loading in the different uh, uh, different uh, the carrier like polyol GOPT and some uh, the polyester resin polyester resin system so so and you can see here we have like a uh, the wide range variety of viscosity and tix index uh, tix index this is just an example and we do also uh, some uh, uh, like customize uh, uh, like a re resin uh, customize the product where we uh, we take the customer resin and then disperse uh, you know the load the graphene uh, make the master batch and and provide them uh, for their uh, the end application uh, end application so uh, at the chromoflow we have uh, we have like a, you know uh, like graphene dispersion, like high loading graphene dispersion in monomer, plasticizer, water, uh, the solvent based styrene, uh, and polystyrene epoxy poly. Also, uh, what basically we are uh, we are providing here, like you know, providing uh, the dust free dispersion to customer. Like okay, uh, there are many uh, uh, many in industry, many people they are not capable of dealing, uh, you know, to handle this nanoparticle because you have a lot of uh, EHS. A concern involved there so and then also it's well uh, dispersed and stabilized dispersion which promote homogeneity in uh, in final application and then quality control we make sure that you get the consistent uh, uh, there's no lot to lot variation in performance and also uh, this, uh, your dis our dispersion is comp uh, uh, compatible with other uh, you know uh, different kind of raging system different kind of uh, uh, the host uh, material so and we also support uh, to uh, to customer to provide uh, uh, like a, uh, the methodology to incorporate uh, these uh, graphene dispersion into their system so Paul you wanted to add some yeah, I, I think you've actually covered it very nicely, Santosh. Um, the thing I want to emphasize is that the process from start from your manufacturer's process, your supplier's process, to your internal uh, mixing or incorporation or dispersing process, through your through the final application of molding and or or, or coating or apply application process, every step of the process makes a difference, and every every step of it is going to be very important to achieving your your final properties. If you need to reach us. We are located in our in, in Chromaflow Technologies in our Ashtabula, Ohio facility. Uh, my phone number and Santosh's is listed here and uh, as well as our email address if you'd like to reach out to us with any questions. And we'd like to thank you also for your patience and your participation. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you both for that. Um, we're gonna go to uh, Q&A right now. And so we've, we've got quite a few questions. Um, I, I think one of the things that always strikes me when we look at uh, graphene dispersions is uh, both both of you, have, uh, both companies have presented on the extremely small uh, or low load factor, so tenths of a percent by weight, and yet getting these 20, 30, 40 percent improvements in performance, whether it's in strength or barrier properties and such as that. So um, what, one of the questions that always comes up is what is the impact of on cost? Right, so if you're looking at these extremely small uh, load factors um, into the end products, and I don't know, Adrian, maybe you can you can touch on that first. But uh, I, I'm sure that many customers, when they hear about you know the nominal price of graphene is not inexpensive, uh, but when you look at the percentages in the end application, it's quite a small amount, and you're using standard processing approaches. What what is the impact on price? I mean, how should customers look at whether they add graphene from an economics uh, perspective. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I mean, just to talk to that, I mean, clearly there's the there's the end-to-end -end discussion to have. Um, you know, you're looking at materials performance enhancement with a remarkable material that can that can be transformational. And yeah, there's a cost associated with that. We've done a huge amount of work um, looking at various stages of that, Terence. So, um, you know, there's there's a cost to a dispersion and you know where uh, somebody wants a quote I have to give you a quote for, for prices for dispersion that's fine um, you know clearly if we're looking at a, say a 10 or a 20 percent dispersion of uh, of a graphene into um, solvents or waters or a resin you know then there's a, a dilution um, aspect to that and you know clearly you've got to understand 
that the say you're adding that into a matrix resin that's part of a component of a composite material for example which we do often as a customized dispersion then you're looking at the cost of that whole dispersion but you're actually substituting the resin that you get in the dispersion with the resin that you would be putting in the composite anyway um, and you know to to really get to the nub of the question is this stuff affordable for the technology gain that you that you make i think there's a judgment call on that with regard to what you're trying to put it into so in the coatings arena for example um you know where graphene you you could say there are there are areas of the of the coatings community that graphene has no real technical advantage to uh, an addition and it's a hugely competitive market why would you even think about doing that you know at the other end of the spectrum where there's an added value opportunity for the the technology gains that you'll make in the um in the coating say for a an ultra harsh environment coating where there's performance gains to be made and there's the cost of the graphene that you're adding to that scenario we we believe it's it's an affordable proposition but you also i think not to forget in all of this the uh knock-on effect of the the end users so our customers customer right. so if you look at for example an infrastructure project and a coating on a bridge you know is that bridge going to or the coating on that bridge going to last longer to reduce the maintenance cycle that the asset owner has to um, has to undergo there's a uh, there's joined up thinking so i mean yes i mean there, there's a price point to anybody's graphene in this community um, we believe that we can make an affordable value proposition for that um, you know and, and in terms of added cost um, to uh, you know if you're looking at something that's sort of 60 70 dollars a kilo material um cost for a coating system you know you're looking at um a few percentage points of addition and right. you've got to you've got to the graphene actually through the dispersion and into the coating system and that's you know similarly true for a composite or anything else you want to look at in thermal adhesives it's somewhat of a different proposition i would say in that you're looking at extremely high loading levels so it's well adrian you know the examples that you gave in your presentation if you look at the salt test on the on the paint coating plus the roofing product right the roofing product had a 20 year lifetime guarantee from that supplier until they use your material now they've increased that to 30 years so that really gives them a competitive advantage in the market and if yeah. we look at some of the marine coatings so there's there's companies like yours and others that are using graphene for marine coatings um it's not just that, you know, the added corrosion protection gets translated into a ship going into dry dock less frequently, which has a huge economic impact. So I think if you look at the total cost of ownership, or if we look now in composites, um, you know, life cycle, you know, the complete life cycle of the materials, how long do they last, their, their utility, when do they become redundant, when does it get, you know, when does it need to be replaced? If you can extend the life cycles, um, there are some, you know, um, e ecological uh, improvements to be made there. So, yeah. Paul, Paul, let me ask you, um, you know, a similar question. I don't know from the economics because you're dealing with end customers all the time doing their custom custom formulation. So, obviously, it's always a, yep. a question of price versus utility. Um, ha what, what's been your experience in looking at materials like graphene and added from an economics point of view? Well, first of all, graphene is not a homologous material. There's a wide ranges of quality and cost structures out there in the market. Um, some are very, sometimes it makes sense to go ahead. For example, if you're going to improve your properties by 30% and reduce the weight of your part by potentially 30% and the thickness of your part to achieve similar or better mechanical properties, sometimes it makes sense to use a more, it's more cost effective to use the more expensive graphene than to use a more cost effective graphene. So it really depends upon your application. Similarly, in a coatings application, uh, you really want to have a very fine layer of graphene across the surface of your coating, and you want it to be located at the surface where you're going to get the benefits, right? So you don't necessarily want a real high loading, 
So again, going with, with quality and cost, I, th I think you're going to get a better bang for the buck. And then again, you also have to impact, consider in, as has already been mentioned, the, uh, the impact upon shelf life or, and, 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 and use, usage life of the material. If you're extending the usage life of the material by an extended period of time, reducing the, increasing the, reducing the amount of money someone's going to spend on recoding and repainting a part in the field, that is huge. Right. Absolutely. And, and so I think you really have to assess the whole cost of the whole process and the whole product when you're trying to say, oh, is it going to work for us to use graphene? Maybe I should just use something cheaper. Well, maybe something cheaper isn't going to do the same job. Right. Or it's cost effective. Um, another question, you know, we are looking at commercial application and commercial scale of these products. So one of the questions is, you know, how sensitive is this process um, to do the dispersions? Does it need to be uh, done under ideal lab conditions or obviously in, in, uh, in production processes, they're not always, um, let's say, ideal conditions. So how sensitive is this dispersion process and how do you address some of those variabilities that you get in the real world where, you know, the product might sit in a warehouse, you've got temperature variations, you might not have the best uh, environment in which to, to do the dispersion. Can you, can you speak to that? Maybe, Paul, do you want to start with that one or, or Santosh? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go ahead and start, get started on it. Um, First of all, when you're when you're talking about manufacturing in, in, the, in the real world environment, um, graphene is not your normal dry powder that you just toss into something, right? There's EHS considerations, there's worker safety considerations, there's a lot that has to go into controlling your your environment, your process for making it, and and secondly, you also have to, without getting into the EHS side of it, you also have to be concerned about the technical uh, quality side of what is the impact of your process to the particle. And if we, we spent some time talk, showing some examples where um, you, you have improperly dis dispersed graphene and you don't achieve the end properties you're after, then you spend a lot of money uh, on, on a fairly high cost product and to, to, to come up empty. So you don't really want to get into that scenario. It's much better to have a well-designed process that's, that gives you a robust, it's, 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 it's inherently robust, and gives you a robust product that will stand up to a wide variety of conditions. Now, in terms of like putting in a warehouse and storing it, if you achieve a good stable dispersion, hopefully you, you, you do the stability testing, you know, at 40 and 60 Celsius or some such to uh, verify that you achieve, you know, that your material is going to be stable for an extended period of time under a variety of conditions. Excellent. So that, that's, that's kind of the answer I have to that one. And Adrian, Adrian, you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, Clearly, it's it, keep coming back. But it's all about end-to-end -end thinking, and um, you know, being being aware. We put a huge amount of effort in engaging with the end customer. You know, not just about um, what we do in the lab, but how they are going to use this material. So, um, you know, whether it's going into a coating, a composite, uh, whatever it is, and we've got a range of of customers. You know, where they're their process conditions on their actual shop dictate that they have to add this dispersion at a certain point. And so, you know, the part of the process is uh, helping, helping the customer to understand um, and to, to further customize our product in some cases to actually enable them to integrate this material in, in what they commonly do. But, you know, if you've got to introduce a lot of change to introduce a new material, you've got a question, are you actually going to do that? Um, so, you know, we in, in terms of our, our approach, we want to be as aligned as we can be with our customer in terms of how they're going to utilize this product. And, and to, your other, to your other side of their question about what we do. So, you know, we do a huge amount of work in terms of all of the as we were talking about before, the salt spray testing, the this and that and the other, you know, six months, nine months, a year's worth of work of, uh, of proving that graphene works in a range of applications. Um, and we do that in our R&D labs. Clearly, there's a scaling aspect to that. And we, you know, we equally put in the, the effort to make sure that what we have scaled in terms of getting to high volume uh, scaled manufacturing is representative of all the lab work that we did in the first place. Otherwise, right. you know, if you if you if you process it 
it's the age old adage, I suppose, make a change, expect a change. And, yeah. you know, if you change your process, are you going to um, still end up with those same aspects of material, such as particle size and, um, you know, viscosity profile and so on yeah. and so on yeah. and so on. There's one last question I'd like to take before we kind of close off here today. And, and there are a ton of questions we're just not going to get to, but <clears throat> one is about, you know, is there some kind of like guide or uh, uh, rule of thumb about, you know, which graphene is best for which type of application for which uh, type of attribute that we want? And I, and I think I know the answer to this. Um, and of course, you guys do know the answer to this is that there's so many different types of graphene. The detailed morphology is so different that I don't think we're yet at the stage where there's a common body of knowledge that's kind of like a, a, a dictionary or a directory of, okay, if you want to get this outcome, then this is the type of material you use. Um, but uh, by the same token, we don't want to give the impression to everybody that this is some black art and that only a few people know the secrets to the kingdom. There's some pretty straightforward approaches to this. But the fact that <clears throat> at this particular stage, um, there are many different types of graphene that are manufactured um, I think the important point I'd want to try to convey and, and like to have you kind of comment on this is that we've moved beyond the stage of, you know, this is purely exper experimental and that uh, there are some proven results that we know graphene can truly enhance in a commercial setting uh, th these attributes. It's real world. We've moved beyond that kind of pure R&D stage. We're into the commercialization. And the project, again, that we're doing with Chromaflow's help on testing actual uh, actual pieces of uh, composite materials to demonstrate, you know, some of the physical attributes um, is going to go a long way to provide some more uh, public data on those. Um, but you, you, you've obviously these two companies, and the reason why we've chosen these companies to help do this presentation today, these companies have obviously accumulated a huge body of experience and knowledge in how to do these dispersions. Um, it, I'm not sure really um, where, the, where the question lies at this point, but um, would you like to make just a, a couple of uh, maybe closing remarks on, um, on, uh, on this particular topic about dispersion, why it's so important? And, and my last um, comment on this would be, you know, I, I would encourage customers that want to use this material to engage closely with companies like Applied Graphene Materials and like Chromaflow who have the experience and can assist you in avoiding a long and tortuous and expensive self-discovery uh, period to get through this. This is, um, th they've gone through working with, you know, hundreds of iterations of these materials and all different host materials to, to figure out what actually works. And that is their, um, you know, their, their expertise and their IP. So Adrian do you, and, and Andy, you guys want to make some closing comments on what we've discussed well, today? I'll I'll let Andy comment on it a bit further, perhaps, but uh, all, all I'll say is, um, yeah, 10 years in the making, as I, <laughs> as I touched on at the, at the start of our presentation. You know, we've been doing this for a good while, just in terms of uh, uh, looking at the, initially the, the sort of twinkle in our founding professor's eye about an alternate way of making graphene through to process scale up for that material. But the last few years have been completely focused on dispersion technology and the how to and how to actually join the dots in simple terms about taking this remarkable material, whether it's our material or whether it's anybody else's material. I fundamentally believe that the keys to that are in being able to put it into the right stuff for it to end up in the customer's um, formulation, whatever that might be. Andy, you want to talk any? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I mean, for me, it, uh, you, you touched the right point. I mean, graphene as a product is a fantastic product, but as soon as you put it into something, a lot of those properties are are, are lost in a lot of cases and certainly diminished. If you get your dispersion right, you get your application method right, then you can benefit from a lot of those properties. And you know, like I say, we've done a lot of work on this. The guys, at Chromaflow have done a lot of work on it, so it, it's almost why reinvent the wheel you know come and talk to us you know we're, we're very open in terms of those communications and those conversations we can we can have that and, and and optimize your system so that you can get graphene into it the right graphene at the right loading levels at the right costs to make sure that you get a benefit yeah i would like to just add that like uh, you know it's just not the 
the graphene quality matters. It's a matter how you incorporate, how you process, and what what is the loading. So all like hold the process. They are just not. It's just not the magic material. You take it and put it anywhere, and you're gonna to get your uh, the final property. So everything matters. Yeah. There's one more point I want to add to this. There's a slide that Santo showed to everybody that that I think really hits the nail right on the head. If you get the uh, graphene dispersed and you put it into a matrix, you can sometimes see a night and day difference when it's properly dispersed when it's not, simply on how it behaves within the matrix. If it doesn't behave within the matrix properly, you're gonna see like a thin cloud of flocculation. We get down to uh, the particle size that we're talking about here. Say, we, we spend a lot of time talking about particles that are, that are in a neighborhood of five to 10 um, carbon atom uh, layers in, in, in the surface, you know, width, breadth, and uh, so we're talking about something that you know we're we're, we're getting all, we're almost leaving classical physics, moving into quantum mechanics, and forces like Van der Waal that are normally not all that strong a force start to become really predominant. So so under, recognizing that and not treating a graphene uh, particle or graphene product like a like a standard say carbon black. Is, is really kind of fundamental and very important. So I'm just, I'm just gonna leave it on that particular slide. From the Graphene Council perspective, I really appreciate everybody sharing. I wanna uh, just leave everyone with this slide. If you look at this, this, this is one of the reasons why graphene is so exciting is it can be used in all these different application areas for many different um, outcomes, whether it's electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, increasing strength, et cetera. And both organizations, both Applied Graphene Materials and Chromaflow touched on that as well in their presentation. So I just want to bear in mind, because we have people from all over the world, all different industries listening in today. For the Graphene Council, those of you who are not a member of the Graphene Council, things like this webinar, but in particular our graphene report, and more importantly, our ability to help you connect with the supply chain will help you reduce your R&D costs and get to an end application sooner rather than later and at less cost. So I'd encourage you to think about becoming part of this environment. We connect more than 27,000 material scientists worldwide. And we have special uh, benefits for organizational members, which include universities as well as companies. So for myself at the Graphene Council, I want to thank Adrian, Andy, Paul, and Santos for taking the time to prepare this information. I hope it's impressed upon people who are watching today. The type of information you receive from these two companies really is valuable. It is critical to successful applications, and I appreciate them sharing their insights, which literally have taken years and years to accumulate that knowledge. So thank you for that, and thank you for everyone for paying attention and wish you a good rest of your week. Thank you.